forgotten. Yeah. Well, I mean, once, I mean, we were in the army together. He was in the same battalion as me. They shifted him in, they shifted him after a while because we were both light heavyweight, so we couldn't have light two, so they shipped him. But no, Joe, he was a lovely character. He died just a few years ago with a big C, bless his heart. But he, he used to give me more problems and all I thought London three times beat him. I'm not Joe, uh, Dick Richardson out twice. Beat Billy Walker, beat this one, beat that one. Joe used to give me more bleeding trouble. <laughs> he had a he poker didn't. face. You could hit him with your Sunday punch. And um, whenever I hit him with my left hook, I used to see a bit of pain or blank look. Joe used to just roll his head, and you just for a split second, you think, well, man, have I hurt him? And just that split second was enough for him to recover. Oh, I wouldn't have liked to play poker with him. He had the deadpan face. Oh, um, good boxer. How did you prepare for the fights? How long did you give yourself in, 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 in that final training? Well, I always went away. I always went away. I tried. We tried. I had most of my bad performances when I lost fights, which were a bit unexpected when I lost them, was when I didn't go away from home to train or I was trying to put on weight. People kept saying to me, you're too light, put on, put some weight on. Now, if I ever came in a fight, you look at all the bad performances when I boxed bad, I bet I was always 13, 11. Now, this may, this day and age, people might think 13, 11, for that, that was heavy for me. Mm -hmm. I was always 13, 6, 13, 7 and a half. Just that extra three or four pound made all the difference to me. I couldn't, I couldn't, but I was like an old cabals. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, did you, not at, at, at certain size in weigh-ins, you had yeah. to take something with you, didn't you? Yeah, well, see, Jim Wicks was, he was lovely. Jim was always thinking. And he, <clears throat> and whenever I used to fight big guys, I mean, I never, I never minded fighting big guys because usually, I mean, Ali was the exception to the rule. But I used to love, I mean, I fought Jefferson Davis, who was mm. six foot four. He was 16 and a half stone, a big American cowboy, big Texan, you know, big Stetson. <laughs> and and you know, I used to love them guys because you could be in and out. And what Jim, but Jim was always thinking, he used to think, now, I can't get on the scales and come in like what I would have. I'd have been like 13 stone two or something like that. And he used to think they might give him a psychological boost if I came out and they were like a stone and a half. Out. So what Jim used to do, he used to get lead, he used to cut lead soles out and heavyweights in they could get on the scales in their boots. He used to put these lead soles in so I'd get on it. And he had a small weight like that which used to weigh about five pounds. And I used to have it in the hand, no one could see it. And I used to, and I'd still, I was still at only 13 stone seven and <laughs> so in other words, you're actually 12, 11. Yeah, yeah. You oh, could, yeah. could you not put weight on? I couldn't put weight. Oh no, not what, not how I train. So I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know how fighters train now. See, I never done, I never did a lot of weightlifting. I never bulked up. I couldn't do that. Did that did me no good bulking up. So and if I trained in the summer, I mean, my natural weight was 14 stone. The first two or three days in the gym, I'd be down to 13.7, and then I had to train another three weeks for that. I had to say, so, I mean, at times I was down to about 12 stone six because I used to lose so much weight, you know, and I couldn't put on weight. <laughs> Where did the phrase Henry Zammer come from, and who started that? Can you remember? I've got to feel it was Des Ackett in the, Desmond Ackett <laughs> in the, uh, in the, what's the name, the old uh, Daily Express. Express. Yeah. He, he nicknamed my punt Henry Zam. <laughs> Someone actually measured the speed of that punch at one point, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, well, we, we got the farm, bro, aeronautical, aeronautical people to come to the gym, and they had this special camera that took 6,000 frames a second. <laughs> it went like that, you know. <laughs> and they take this ball up and bag up, and then they come out with all these statistics. It was three times faster than the Saturn rocket. It was three times faster than the Saturn rocket, over seven inches. My left hook landed with four and a half tons impact. Four and a half tons in, I said, yeah, well, I, could have, I should have knocked them all out. <laughs> <laughs> was training something you enjoyed? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, see, I, especially as I got older, I enjoyed it more, and a lot of people think that's funny, but I enjoyed it because I could do, I could do a routine in the gym, which a lot of young fighters couldn't do. I mean, I used to dance, I used to do a Russian dance, as good as any Russian. I mean, I could go bum, 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 all out, I could go all around the gym, kicking me legs out, like all oh, what you see, the, 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 the famous Russian dancers. You're Italian dancers, dancers, yeah. And then, as I got older, I'm <laughs> doing it, I've done me cartilage, so I couldn't do that after. And that, they, this was like in latter in my life, in my boxing career, and when I went that went, then my arm problems, 
I knew it was time to call it a day. We've so. talked, uh, you, you've mentioned <laughs> her name, lovely Albina, your, your, your delightful yeah, wife. Bless her um, <laughs> she put up with it, didn't she? She didn't really oh, like you boxing. Oh, she hated boxing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, my wife, she only ever come to one fight, and that was on my in, insistence, and this was when I fought Ali for the world title in 66. She hated every moment. She sat there, she had a programme just in front of her face, never looked at it, and even when I came home and I'd won, she couldn't watch it the next day on television. She'd never watch it on the next day television. Did she, she just, ever try and talk you out of it? No, her? no. She was as good as gold, bless her. Right? No, she always... And that's why, you know, in 71, the last fight with Bogdan, when I said to her two weeks before, this is going to be the last, I had to be true to me word. And that was it. And, I, and people often said to me, well, why didn't you make a comeback and you could have beat him and this and that and had a reader? I said, no, I've got to be fair to my wife because she'd never badgered me. She'd always left it. She knew that I had a good manager in gym. I was sensible myself and when the right time come to call it a day we call it a day which we did we uh, how did you meet her i mean she she's an italian lovely she's lady italian from she italy. comes from a little village in north northern italy about two hours from milan she comes to a little place called bucacci where it, you couldn't even see it on the map and it was like it's a little bit it still is a little bit even about six houses <laughs> not on top of a man on top of a hill well you didn't meet her there no we didn't meet her there we met her in uh, in uh, fresh street not Fresh Street, in um, Gerard, Gerard Street, Street, which was uh, aunt and uncle had about one of the, well, it's the oldest Italian, it was the oldest Italian family-run restaurant called Peter Mario's in them days. But all the showbiz, all the boxing people used to use it, and Jim Wicks used to eat in there, and he actually, when we turned pro, he took brother George and myself into there, and we noticed this, this little Italian where she was a good-looking girl there. She still is good-looking, but, but <laughs> she, really she was is. a little dolly then. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, and I started chatting her up, and we, we got, you know, I knew her for five or six years before I invited her out, yeah. Uh. Were you a rich man when you finished boxing? Not rich as, not rich compared, but I mean, I was, one of the highest paid British boxers, as I said. So, I mean, you know, I did I did well. I did well out of it, let's be honest. I mean, and Jim Wicks was always one to, to like, instill in us that boxing's only for a certain amount of years of your life. When you retire, you're still a young man, so you've got to, you know, you've got to put, put money away and think and pay your tax and think of, of the future, which we did. Unfortunately, I, mean, I was a Lloyds after, right? I mean, I was I was an Amy Lloyds and we have we lost a bit over that, but I'm out of that now, thank God. And well, I mean, just mention past. that because you'd actually prepared for your retirement, hadn't you, in that mm. kind of way by going into Lloyds? Yes. Well, cause, see, I mean, if you look when I joined, I'm talking about, what, 25 years ago when I first became an Amy Lloyds, um, I was uh, for an ordinary working class lad to be invited to become a member because you had to be invited there was plenty of people with plenty of money who couldn't get in in them days and charles and george who was a good friend of mine mm. who used to do all the uh all he used to insure all the big boxing shows for levine in them days um i got to know him very well he was a personal friend of mine and he asked me would i like to become a name under his syndicates in lloyd's which i did yeah and of course initially <laughs> it was marvelous and for a few years i mean we had good years i mean all right i never I, in them days there wasn't fortunes you could earn but i mean it was good i was getting a nice check at the end of the year for about three years then suddenly <laughs> <laughs> that hits you hard it must they were, have oh yeah well um, the, the, the big tragedy was unfortunately see the only way i could get a lump of money quick without perhaps ending myself up in debt and like you know and paying back was to sell my lonsdale belts i had to sell the three lonsdale belts which was a, which was a shame really that, I really mean, must have hit and you that, that was a choker for me yeah it would have been. because you know but it was a choke but all right, I got a lump of money. Uh, they brought auction. I think we done wrong. We went down to Kent and auction them instead of keeping them in London, and and we would have got a lot more money in London than we mm. did in Kent. Mm. But uh, you can only be advised by the auction people, and uh, uh, we didn't get as much as we thought. But I mean, we did it, and I know. And you're free it. of it all now, anyway. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. out of it now. Thank God, with e e equity coming in, we've we've got out of it. Has yeah. it surprised you that when you finished boxing, that you? You were even more loved by the British public than when you were in the ring. I mean, you, yeah, they had they had such an affection. Oh, I always yeah. have, and you still have. Whenever yeah, I go out with yeah. you now, well, they marvelous. make such yeah. an enormous fuss of you. Yeah, I mean, you've yeah. you've so, a very special place in in, in the hearts of this well, nation. Well, it's true you? what you say, Dick, and I've never tried to analyse it, and I don't want to because you know you think, please God, it carries on because wherever you go, people want to say hello, they want to shake your hand, they want you all up, and when people do that, they're paying you a compliment. And that's the only way you can look at it. And, and when I see young athletes and young whatever, whoever, 
sometimes you see kids come up to them, they just go, they poo hour them away, I'll go away, I can't, I think, oh, you don't know, you don't know what you're doing, son, you, you don't know, they're the ones who are going to pay your wages all for the rest of your life and things, you know. I, I, yeah. I talked about my sharpest memory, and that was, of course, yeah. the first fight with Clay. What yeah. are your happiest memories, looking back on your career? Well, I think, you know, when, when you've had such a long career like I have, I think basically what I'm so happy about is that uh, I fought a lot of good fighters. Um, I beat a lot of them, so, you know, you've got a pretty good record there. I was, I'm the only man who's ever won three Lonsdale belts out, right? Well, no one can do that because they've changed the rules now because it was costing the border control so much money. <laughs> so they had to change the rules. But I'm the only one anyway who ever did in previous years. Uh, I had a good career. I've got a... I've got a lovely wife, I've got two great sons, they're both married, I'm a grandfather, I've got a lovely kid. The youngest one is married to Sean, they're not family mine, I don't think, but uh, anyway, they're all, they're all happily married. Um, I've got good health, I'm playing golf and I'm playing decent golf. I know, I play with you and against you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so one I'm fight we have, one scrap we haven't talked about was the one you had with Edith Summerskill, who was a member of parliament and in fact a member good of the old, House of Lords at one the point, good wasn't old she? Doctor. Yeah, well, yeah. she sat in the House of Commons for about 30 years, and the yeah. last 10 years she sat in the House of Lords, and they asked me, would I appear on Granada TV you better, with her? You better tell everybody yeah. why you had these scraps with her, because she kept on, <laughs> she was trying to get rid of boxing, wasn't well, she? Well, she was very anti-boxing, wasn't she? I mean, uh, whenever she was out of the public eye, she used to bring this subject about boxing being down, should be banned, and she used to get a bit of publicity. And they asked me to go up to Granada, so I'll go up in Leeds, and I'm thinking, now, I'd better play a bit careful, because she debating her a strong suit. And I'd seen her about a week or two previous with Solomons, and Solomons had got a bit aggressive with her, and she tied him up and made him look about that small. So I thought, I'll be all sweetness and lightness to her, you know? So <laughs> when I get there... <laughs> I'm sitting next to her, and, she, and the program had going on for five or ten minutes, and she'd been smiling at me, and I'd been smiling back at her, and I'm thinking, let me pay me cards, all right, I'll take her home tonight, you know? <laughs> And then suddenly she came out in a, with a voice, which I imagine she woke up in the house of laws with, she said, Mr Cooper, have you got recently and seen the state of your nose? And I thought, well, what a cheeky... I mean, you don't like being rude to a lady. And so I thought, well, I've got to come back at you, love. So I said, madam, I said, have you got up recently? Looked in the mirror and seen the state of your nose? I said, blimey, boxing was my excuse. What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone erupted in the... They all erupted in the studio. I thought, oh, I'm doing. <laughs> but what do you say to the people that uh, are anti-boxing now? I mean, how do you defend the sport? Well, I must say, it's getting harder to defend it. See, when you get, when you get someone like Tyson who bites yeah. another boxer's ear off, how, how can you defend? See, there's no defence there. See, and what I, I think, I said, fancy a guy like Tyson. I mean, you're making bullets for the anti-boxing people to fire at you when you do things like that. So it is hard to, to uh, explain it when you get things like that. But I still think boxing, when it's controlled properly, and I still think British boxing is the best the best run and best controlled boxing there is in the world. We look after our fighters in this country. Our fighters are examined twice. You have to have a brain scan. But, I mean, it'd be a terrible outlook on life because there's danger connected with certain things. The easy option is that if anything danger is, say, ban it. That means, you know, that's crazy. The human being, man, is what motivates man to carry on and do things in life, exploration. In the, to the moon or across the world. Can you imagine years ago if they just said, oh, it's dangerous, when they thought the world was flat, you went and you went over the edge and you... Uh, well, someone said, no, we'll take a chance. It's not, you know, it's not, it's round. And we found out. I mean, no, because there's danger, don't want to ban everything. Let's take precautions. If boxers need to be examined three times a year, examine them three times a year. But don't ban it, because if you're talking about banning dangerous sports, You've got to ban, before you ban boxing, you've got to ban horse riding and all. There's more deaths from horse riding and people with broken necks and laying like cripples with horse riding. You've got to ban rugby. Now, the whole thing they come out and say, ah, but boxing, boxing is one man goes out. I see a one minute. You see modern day rugby. You mean to tell me, when, you mean to tell me when that guy's going there, he's not meaning to do damage. When that fast bowler bowls a beamer, he's not trying to get the guy out, he's trying to hit the guy. And that I mean that's so that's I mean that's all and, and more people die playing cricket than ever do people die playing playing boxing. So you're convinced that boxing should have a place uh, in the yeah. next century? I think it should, but I don't think it will. 
Why? I don't think... Well, boxing's killing itself. Boxing's killing itself. They're putting... See, when you get boxing putting too many one-sided fights on, so yeah. you can't con to the... You can't con the public. If you, you can con them once, you'll con them twice, but you can't keep doing it. And that's what they're doing. See, you can't get fighters, you know, whoever they are. I won't name them, but you can't put good fighters in with you know, second raiders, so the guys are going there and knocking them over in a round, a round and a half. If you've paid, if you're paying now, and big fights now, 150, 200 quid for ringside seats, mm. and you go in there, the kid gets in the ring, and while it's all over in a minute and a half, a round and a half, you're cheating the public. And that's what they're doing. Mm. I mean, they're, they're cheating the public now. If if you can't put a good opponent in, don't make, don't make the match, don't make a fight. Yeah. But that's what they're doing. They're putting second-rate fighters in. They're just putting fodder, as I say, dead bodies for good fighters to knock over. And that's killing the game. What do you think of the current uh, <clears throat> heavyweights? I mean, the Leonard 17 Lewis. stone heavyweights. Well, they're all battleships now, no, they're all big battleships. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, it's totally different from when, from when I was boxing. See, now... I mean, they keep saying if you're 15 stone, you're not big enough. I think that's a load of nonsense. If you're big enough, if you're good enough, you're big enough. I mean, you only got to look at Evander Holyfield. He's not six foot four and 17, 18 stone. In fact, he was a cruiserweight to start off. He was it? a cruiserweight. He's fit. Look at Tyson, his prime, 15 stone. They're all big enough. If mm. you're good enough, you're, you're big enough. Um, no, see, what they do, they all bulk up now. Now, I think the best moving heavyweight in the world today is Lennox Lewis. But he's not when he comes in at 17 stone 12 and 17 stone 13, which he comes in at. When he comes in 17 stone, just under 16, 10, he's, a good, he's the best moving heavyweight in the world today. Uh, why they want to bulk up? You wouldn't walk around with two great big shopping bags all day. You'd be <laughs> knacker, wouldn't you? And that's all you do if you're putting a stone on. That's all you're doing. Excess weight, bulk up. You're gonna and that excess that. weight is not uh, adding yeah. anything to the punch, is punch? it? Of course it's not. No. You've, if you're 15 stone, 15 stone in my mind is the ideal weight for an heavyweight. You've got weight for punch and you can have mobility. Look at, look at Ali in his prime. When I boxed him in, I say, 63, 14 stone 11, moving like a middleweight. When I boxed him the second time in 66, he was 15 stone 4, moving like a middleweight. You don't, you don't want more weight than that. Henry, on reflection, what was the most amusing thing that might have happened in your, in your career as a boxer? Oh, dear. That's always a... It's <laughs> a hard a, one, isn't it? That's always a hard one to... Uh, well, you've seen some funny things, I mean, over the years. I mean, you know, we had an amateur years ago when I was boxing. He used to, he, he had like a mop of red air and he used to come in and he'd all be gloved up and they'd take you And the last thing they used to do is the bell went dong, his trainees go whoop, and it was a, it was a wig. <laughs> he had alopecia as a kid and he had pulled this wig and the kid just go, go uh, and while he was like, bosh, he, he had more first round victories. <laughs> well, talking of wigs, what about Floyd Patterson? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, well, Floyd, I mean, see. <laughs> see, when Liston beat him the first time, that affected him, I think, meant he could never come to terms that Liston had beaten him in the first round. And he used to pack into his gear after that. He used to put in his gear up on, on a big fight night. When I used to go, I used to go for my feet out. I used to put my boots, my socks, my jock strap, my protector, my shorts, my dressing gown, my towel, my gum shield, Vaseline, this, that, and that. That was all I wanted. He used to 